Welcome. Welcome to the Rexburg Temple celebration. What a glorious time. We acknowledge tonight the presence of Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and his wife, Wendy. Grateful to have them here. Elder Nelson presides at this event tonight. He's asked that I, President Kimby Clark, conduct. We'd like to acknowledge as well Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and his wife, Susan. Elder Claudio R. M. Costa of the Presidency of the Seventy and his wife, Margaret. And F. And F. Michael Watson, Secretary to the First Presidency and his wife, Jolene. We also have many other church and community leaders, representatives from the media, and special guests seated with us this evening. We welcome them all. We extend also a special welcome to those joining us in overflow locations throughout the Rexburg Temple District. We also remind you tonight to silence your cell phones. Flash photography will not be permitted during the event. We'll begin tonight by singing Holy Temples on Mount Zion. Our chorister will be Kendall Nielsen and Daniel Kerr will be at the organ. Following the opening hymn, the invocation will be offered by President Jared C. Hepworth, president of the Rexburg, Idaho Center Stake. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful this evening, a time of celebration of the great many blessings that thou hast poured upon us. We're grateful for the moisture that we've received in this drought-stricken area. We're grateful for the temple that has been completed and the dedication that will be held tomorrow. We're grateful to be together to celebrate this wonderful occasion, the house of the Lord, in thy name. Be with us this night. Bless the youth as they perform. 
We appreciate the celebration, the committee, and all the work that they put together this program. We're grateful for those who are in charge of the script, those that have to do with choreography, the orchestra, the music, the directors. Let them know of our great love and appreciation for the great efforts that they have put forth for this program this night. Be with the youth especially. Help them to have thy spirit and thy love that they'll all want to return to thy holy house often, especially when they return unto thee, receive the ordinances of the priesthood and endowments, and to be sealed in the holy house. We're grateful unto thee for all thy blessings. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're privileged to have Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles with us tonight. Elder Nelson will say a few words this evening. We're grateful for that. Following his remarks, there will be a brief intermission as the youth assemble into their positions. Following the intermission, we will turn the time to President Greg Moeller of the Rexburg East Stake, the chairman of the Rexburg Temple Celebration Committee. President Moeller will introduce tonight's program. At the conclusion of the program this evening, we ask that the audience remain seated while the brethren depart the auditorium and while the children leave the floor. Elder Nelson. Thank you, President Clark. Good evening, brothers and sisters. It's a joy to be with you. You're quite a shining contrast to the white and cold of winter outside. Wendy and I were just talking about the last experience like this that we had was three months ago in the island kingdom of Tonga. This Saturday night before their temple was to be rededicated, the youth gathered in a festival such as this and put on a wonderful show. It was a very hot evening. And uh, climate's different. Then we were seated next to the king of Tonga, Tonight, we're seated next to the president of the university. We also have other previous presidents of the university here tonight. Brother David A. Bednar, Brother Joe J. Christensen, and other presidents are here in spirit, such as President Henry B. Eyring and President Bruce C. Hafen. They send their love and greetings to you as well. I would like to pass the microphone to my associate, Elder David A. Bednar of the Twelve, because he has a special feeling of fondness for everyone here. Brother Bednar, will you continue my speech for me? <laughs> this is a most familiar setting. You are a beautiful sight, and what a blessing it is to be here with you. As I've been seated here tonight, I've had a flood of memories pass through my mind, but in particular, I've been drawn to the boys and girls down on the floor. I can recall when I was 12 years old attending the dedication of the Oakland Temple, and I remember then seeing President David O. McKay. Even as I describe to you now my memory of seeing President McKay, I can remember him coming out of the Oakland Temple following the dedication. Now, for you boys and girls, tomorrow will be one of the very first official acts in the presidency of President Thomas S. Monson. And someday, when you are as old as I am, you will remember this day tomorrow and the dedication of the Rexburg, Idaho Temple. Now, tonight we will celebrate, and it will be fun, and it will be wonderful. But tonight, in your prayers, will you specifically pray that you will have a memory of the sacred event that will take place tomorrow, and that you will feel the spirit of the Holy Ghost. And the answer to that prayer will be something that will assist you throughout all of your life, just as my memory of the dedication of the Oakland Temple many, many years ago has blessed my life. Tomorrow we will bless and dedicate a house of the Lord, and I witness that it is His house, 
His spirit will be evident there tomorrow. And we look forward to that great occasion with all of you, but especially with you boys and girls. I testify that the Savior lives in his sacred name, even the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. My name is Greg Moeller, and I am the chairman of the Rexburg Temple Celebration Committee. On behalf of my committee, we would like to welcome all of the general authorities from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here with us this evening, along with the local church leaders, local community leaders, and all of you that are joining us in the Hart Auditorium at Brigham Young University, Idaho this evening. We would also extend a very warm welcome to the tens of thousands of people throughout the Temple District that are watching this via satellite in their stake centers and other designated venues. I would like to take just a moment and thank the members of my committee. Their names are in the program that have been provided to you, but few people will know the countless hours of dedicated work and service they put in to bring this performance about this evening. These are people, for the most part, that I did not know before I received this assignment. But over the last nine months, I've come not only to know them, but to love them, to respect them, and trust them greatly. I'll be sad when this is over that we will not have the frequent association that we've had over the last few months. At this time, I would also like to express appreciation to all of the youth. Over 2,000 youth from the Temple District are involved in this performance this evening. I would like to thank the parents and the leaders that have been so helpful in bringing them to practice, bringing them to rehearsals, and supplying so many things that help bring this performance to pass. I would like to take just a moment and especially acknowledge the youth from the Driggs, Idaho stake. As most of you know, we've had rather immoderate weather lately. And because of that, the Driggs children were not able to make any of the practices because the road was closed every time we held a practice. A few of them were able to be here last night and will be performing. The others that were not able to make it, we want them to know that we appreciate all their hours and months of work and practice, and we appreciate them so much, and I hope they don't feel left out this evening. Now, I've mentioned the word work several times. This really has been a labor, but it's been a labor of love. Love for the Lord, love for the temple, and love for the great temple-building prophet of the Restoration, President Gordon B. Hinckley, to whom we dedicate this performance this evening. We also dedicate this performance to the memory of pioneers past and to pioneers current who have helped make a temple in Rexburg a reality. These were people that came here to build Zion, and in a very real way, the completion of the temple is a vindication of their efforts. Now tomorrow, as was mentioned, we will be dedicating the temple. That will be a joyful experience, but it will also be very solemn. That's why tonight is set aside for celebration. If at any time during the performance you feel inspired to applaud or cheer, please do so. It would be appropriate. After all, this is a celebration. And now, brothers and sisters, let the celebration begin. Everybody go forward and back. Sido and don't be slow. Head couple sashay down. Sashay back. Head couple real. Right dear honey. Left to the outside. Keep on going and I'm through yet. Big foot up and a little bit down. Make that big foot stand the ground. To the bottom, sashay back. Form two lines, cast off. Gents go G and the girls go hop. Make an arch, everybody under the arch. Back to the top. New head couple. Forward and back. Now 
Sado Sado and around and around. Head couple sashay down to the bottom. Sashay back. Now new head couple. Real. Right to your honey. Left to the outside. Right to your honey again. If I had a gal, she couldn't dance. Tell you what I'd do. I'd buy her a boat and set her afloat. Paddle my own canoe. Keep on going down that set. Now new couple sashay back to the top. Form two lines. Cast off. Gents go G and the girls go hop. And you make an arch. Underneath the arch you go. That's it. Over 120 years ago, a small group of Mormon pioneers were asked by their leaders to leave the green valleys and productive farms of northern Utah's Cache Valley and move far north to colonize the high mountain deserts of eastern Idaho. 
These pioneers were uprooted from the verdant sod of their homes and transplanted amidst the sagebrush, lava rock, and high winds of the upper Snake River Valley. This is their story. This is our story. The West, the last and largest frontier of a great colonization, a land hallowed and preserved by the hand of the Lord as an inheritance for those he would lead here. Father Lehi prophesied, there shall none come into this land save they shall be brought by the hand of the Lord. And bring them he did, from Lewis and Clark and their Corps of Discovery in 1805, to trappers and explorers like John Coulter and Beaver Dick Lee, to the famous explorer and guide Jim Bridger, who once offered $100 for the first ear of corn grown in this inhospitable new land. In 1810, Fort Henry was established near the Henry's Fork of the Snake River, the first fur trading post west of the Rocky Mountains. In 1832, Pierre's Hole Rendezvous near Victor, Idaho, saw the gathering of trappers and mountain men. When the Mormon pioneers crossed the Great Plains in 1847 and had settled the valleys of Utah, the stage was set for the history, heritage, and settlement of the Teton Valley and Idaho's Snake River country. Dear brothers and sisters, insomuch as the saints have started settlements in Arizona, Southern Utah, and the Idaho country, we are extending to you the great opportunity and blessing to volunteer to settle the Snake River Valley. <laughs> Brother Thomas E. Ricks, a valiant and tested soul, will lead the effort. We hope many will choose to join him. Scouting parties have said this North Country is a wild and beautiful place with running streams of fresh water, cool nights, and plenty of good land. Reports indicate that sagebrush and lava rock will have to be cleared, but they have said that there are almost no mosquitoes, very little wind, and mild winters. I don't know, Eliza. We're barely settled here in Cache Valley. I just finished the roof last week. The garden's getting on, and between me and the mule, I don't know if I can plow one more stitch of land. Oh, Charles, you know the Lord has blessed us. I think we should follow Brother Ricks. We can make something more for our boys. After all, they'll each need land of their own someday. But more important, we can help the Lord build his kingdom. Amos, I'll not be moved again. I don't care if there are a thousand acres of ripe grain waiting for us. I've just painted the parlor and ordered two new chairs. Now, Sarah, you just said last week we need room to grow. Why well, here up there you can homestead 160 acres just by staying out the year? I don't see why we have to move again. None of my friends are going. Why can't we just stay here? Mom. Come on, girls. We survived two moves already. What's one more? Get your things in the wagon and we'll be fine. Fine? Mom? Yes, fine. And remember, it was a family decision to go after family prayer for confirmation. I, for one, still strongly feel the Lord's blessing for our journey. Mom? Lucy, you are the strongest and best woman I know. This may test my faith a little, but with you by my side, I'm willing to go anywhere. I pray God will be mindful of us and give us the strength Mom! that we need. Mom! What is it, Petey? Are we there yet?
During the first year, we worked clearing the land of sagebrush. It was as high as a man sitting on a horse. We worked getting logs out for building a house and other outbuildings. In the spring, we would float them down the river, riding the logs. We were in and out of the icy water. It was freezing weather, but being healthy and robust, we were able to stand the hardships. Richard Hogue Smith, Rexburg. February, continuous rain for a month. Earth roofs leaked, streams of mud drizzled through. March, it snowed three feet, then froze so hard the crust would hold up wagons and sleds. Joseph Johnson, Teton Valley. I shall never forget our reaching the summit beyond Canyon Creek, where we could look into the Teton Valley. The vision we beheld was overpowering. Indeed, it looked like the promised land. Don C. Driggs, Teton Valley. Many times it was 20 below zero and sometimes lower, with the wind howling around the little lone log cabin. If the tiniest crack was left open, the snow would drift across the room. Horace Hess, Ashton. The mosquitoes were so thick that it was impossible to endure them. We made nets to cover our hats down to our shoulders. Whenever we slapped the reins on one of our mules, it left a strip of blood because of the insects. They were so thick, it was necessary to eat with one hand and swat them with the other. Robert Fisher, Eaton. Here's some cool water, Charles. You've been working so hard, you must be nigh on spent. I am feeling a mite, Tucker. This ground's as hard as an iron flapjack. Honey, I don't know if we can make it up in these parts, unless we take a like at eating jackrabbit stew. We've been plowing ground and planting wheat. Last night's frost just about did it in. 
Seems like the only thing that grows around these parts is potatoes. And there can't be much future in them. I know, Charles. We've tried. We've really tried. But I've about come road to the end of my rope. It's just one thing after another. Last night, the wind howled so loud it woke the baby. And this morning, the sourdough batter was full of grit. Sometimes, sometimes I just think we should go back to Logan. There, there, Eliza. Tomorrow's church meeting down Iona way will lift our spirits. Perhaps we'll find our answer in what Wilford Woodruff has to say. The Spirit of the Lord rests mightily upon me, and I feel to bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. I promise the climate will be moderated for your good. I can see these great sagebrush prairies as far as the eye can reach turned into fertile fields. I bless the land that it will yield forth in its strength flowers and trees and fine homes shall grace this great valley from one end to the other. Schools and colleges of higher learning will be built to serve you, that you may learn the mysteries of God's great universe. I see churches and meeting houses dotting the landscape where the God of Israel may be worshiped in spirit and in truth. And yes, as I look into the future of this great valley, I can see temples. I can see beautiful temples erected in the name of the living God, where holy labors may be carried on in his name for generations to come. time the words of the prophecy were fulfilled, the elements were tempered, the valley flourished, and the crops grew.
The early saints took heart and followed the Lord's advice. If thou art merry, praise the Lord with singing, with music, with dancing, and with a prayer of praise and thanksgiving.
Thomas E. Ricks and his associates accomplished more in two years in building canals, fences, and bridges than I have ever known of in the course of five years. They worked on the scrapers day and night and barely had enough to live on those first two years. Samuel Swanner, early Idaho pioneer. I sat with my back against the cabin. From my promontory, I looked across the valley. The tall sagebrush stretched into the distance. The knee-high grasses waved in the breeze. Upon the cedars, willows, and pines, the sun cast shadows, making a picture of rare beauty and delight. This land should be called Sunnydale, I said. Mrs. Holly agreed. Cyrus Holly, Sunnydale. One day an outlaw with a bad tooth came to Rexburg and hunted me down. He came in the house and laid his two guns down on the table. My wife and daughter were frightened enough that they hid in the closet. When I finally got the tooth out, he said, it's a good thing you got that tooth out whole, man, or I would have filled you full of lead. I replied, if I would have broken that tooth, you would have swallowed those forceps. Joseph Morris, first dentist in Rexburg. In those early days, the nearest store was at Market Lake. It was a three-day trip with team and wagon, including fording of the Snake River. The trip was usually made with neighbors. The children looked forward to the return of their fathers who always brought back a tree to candy and peanuts. James Park, Hibbert. One night after we were first married, I was awoken by Cheryl with his foot in my back pulling on my long braids, saying, whoa, whoa. He had battled a team of runaway horses that day. He nearly pulled me bald before I got him awake. Ella Potter, wife of James Shirley Potter, Milkrick, Teton Basin. A child in convulsions was doused in water until it recovered. A broken bone was set for Charlie Smith. Another man's ship was thrown out of joint and almost as quickly thrown back by the strength of four big men. Mr. Charles Edmund Luthy suffered from a hernia, and the family telegraphed to Logan for Dr. Ormsby to come at once, no matter the cost. He arrived in Rexburg a little late. The man had died. The bill was $150. Phineas Tempest, Rexburg. There was a closeness and friendliness about the one-room schoolhouse. Our seats were double desks where two sat together, which made it convenient for whispering. We had no blackboard, but read from a chart as the teacher pointed at the words for the children to read in concert. Elizabeth Spory stole. boys. Thank you. Are we all here? Very good. Sit up nice and tall. And together, in the year 1888, the Church Board of Education advised all state presidents to establish academies in each state where religion could be taught as well as academic subjects. Where the, where the Bible, Bible Book, Book of, of Mormon, Mormon, and Doctrine and Covenants could be used for text. With donations totaling $186.10 in cash, 40 bushels of wheat, and two cows, President Thomas E. Ricks sought to purchase desks and outfit the Rexburg First War Chapel. With Jacob Sporey as its first principal, the Bannock Stake Academy was dedicated on a cold November day in 1888. 
with the death of President Ricks in September of 1901, a motion was made to honor him by renaming the school Ricks Academy. The motion was carried unanimously. Through the years, the little institution faced many hardships, yet with optimism, hard work, and a special spirit, which came to be known as the Spirit of Ricks, the school grew and prospered, fulfilling beyond measure each prophecy uttered by inspired leaders. The seeds we are planting today will grow and become mighty oaks, and their branches will run all over the earth. Principal Jacob Spory, First Principal, Bannock Stake Academy. On the evening of July 23rd, I came to Rexburg to deliver the oration at the 24th of July celebration. Rick's Academy seemed nothing but a massive stone building standing in the center of a rugged 10-acre plot of ground with sagebrush and lava rock. I stood lonely and very depressed and silently shed tears to think I was bringing my dear wife and children to this place to try to make a home. I climbed further up the slope and looked farther over this great valley. I suddenly seemed to catch the spirit of the pioneers and to dream of the great potentials that lay before me. I saw the future of a fine residential city and a great college. Later that morning, when I went to the new tabernacle to deliver my speech, I was inspired as I have seldom been and made a speech that was full of hope and enthusiasm as I gave courage and determination to my eager listeners. I received tenfold of that spirit for myself. I finished that day full of the old pioneer spirit that builds empires. I left Rexburg happy. I felt that I had found a challenge for my young mind, heart, and muscles. Hiram Manwaring, seventh president of Rich College,
goodbye, my Coney Island baby. Farewell, my own true love, true love, my honey. I'm, I'm gonna go away and leave you, never to see you any. Never gonna see you any. I'm gonna sail upon that ferry boat, never to return again. So goodbye, farewell, so long forever. Boom, boom. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney Island. We all fall for some girl. Some girl that dresses neat. Some girl, some girl that's got big feet. Me. We meet her on the street, then we'll join the army, army of merry boobs to the altar. Just like leading lambs to slaughter. When, when it's, it's over, oh boy. oh boy, we get a good bachelor days. We then recall. We then Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief. We all are bound to fall. Goodbye, my Coney Island baby. Farewell, my own true love, true love. My honey, I'm, I'm gonna go away and leave you. Never to see you any, never gonna see you any. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna sail upon that ferry boat, never to return again. Return again. So <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Farewell. So long, forever. Boom, boom. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Bye, my Coney Island. When it was announced that a railroad would be coming, everyone was thrilled, but then Nobody wanted it going through their property, of course. They worried that if the railroad came in, it would bring riffraff into their little town that was predominantly LDS. Ashton got the railroad, and it didn't bring Ashton to its knees. When those pioneers came up here, they started putting in dams and diverting the water, building canals and ditches, and then running the water down to their particular farms. And without that water, you couldn't complete a crop. It's been estimated that we have an aquifer under the state of Idaho as large as Lake Erie. And we've gone so far now that we even drill into the aquifer and get water from great depths and put it up on our drive farms. Back in 19... 27 in December, my dad and his, and his brother were cutting wood up by Warm River. We got down to 40 below zero. The uh, river froze over and the water backed up for two or three miles up the river. In fact, it was running over the top of the bridge. Well, then this particular day, it was a warm day and uh, evidently the ice must have broken loose and the whole river came down over our house. And my mother man in the house and got me, and by the time she got started to cross the field while the water hit us, a couple of pieces of ice came together on my legs and pushed me up out of the water. Mother and I were in the water at least 30 minutes, and it was, it was quite a miraculous experience that either mom and I lived. In the 1930s, we began this presence building up here in the Pratt Ward. And we carried the stone out of the mountain. It was just amazing the, the trials and sacrifices that went into raising enough money to build the church. Putting the cement, the uh, framework, the carpentry, the roof, all of this took place by, by our local people. And all of our children learned to grow up working, herding sheep, milking cows, riding horses, using tractors fixing a fence and working the hayfield. My sweet wife, of course, had always had a garden in which she uh, used the children as well. Weeding and planting and picking raspberries, strawberries, apples, and canning vegetables and fruit. 
Home life was a treasure. Most of the people used to be employed in agriculture. Now we have these big machines. They're so efficient and we produce so much. We take our food for granted. After the war, when I was in Europe, I came to realize how important food was. And the fires of Yellowstone broke out. The fire marshal of the park told us town council that unless the weather changed by tomorrow, uh, we could very well be defending West Yellowstone. The word went out, and by about 9 o'clock, trucks and sprinkler pipe trailers began to roll into town. Rick's College sent up several busloads of students. We had over 16 miles of sprinkler pipe set up in two days. We were grateful that so many people would come to the aid of West Yellowstone.
On the morning of Saturday, June 5, 1976, the greatest disaster in the history of Southeast Idaho occurred. With the flood force of the Mississippi River, the Teton Dam broke, devastating thousands of homes, rendering 250 businesses inoperable, and destroying over 13,000 head of livestock. Remarkably, only 11 people lost their lives. Had the dam broken during the night, the toll would have been much greater. Although the effects of this disaster would be felt for years, the hearts, spirits, and helping hands of the people would survive the tragedy. Volunteers from as far away as Utah, Wyoming, Oregon, and beyond poured into the devastated communities of Rexburg, Sugar City, Wilford, and others to lend assistance and sustenance. Upon visiting the area, government officials were amazed by the organized effort led by the Latter-day Saints and their friends of other faiths. Our hearts wanted to weep a bit as we saw the devastation in your valley. It's been a terrible thing, but we hope and pray that through the years of rebuilding, that you will rebuild so well that the next house you build will be a little better than the one you had before. We hope, too, that while you are building, you will build characters, that your character will show a great improvement so that we will all be living closer to the laws of the Lord and His commandments. Despite the devastation, Precisely one month later, on July 4, 1976, the 4th of July parade was held on Main Street in downtown Rexburg. As the years intervened, the calamity of the flood became a reference point in time, a demarcation of sorts. There were pre-flood and post-flood events and stories. And as the valley settled back into daily life, the rhythm of progress began to beat more loudly in the ears of the people. New buildings arose, businesses prospered, land and crops regained their natural cycle. The whir of the combine, the hum of the mill, the noise of traffic and of modern life. The valleys of Southeast Idaho recovered. These valleys that were settled, cleared, farmed, and nurtured by the LDS people, who by their nature turned a willing ear to their beloved guardians and leaders, the prophets. On June 21st, in the year 2000, 
President Gordon B. Hinckley announced the evolution of Ricks College into BYU-Idaho. Since that time, the Snake River Valley and surrounding areas have undergone tremendous growth and change. Three and a half years later, a momentous event occurred. The First Presidency, in a letter to local church leaders, announced plans for the building of the Rexburg Temple. This announcement became the literal fulfillment of the prophecy uttered by Wilford Woodruff those many years ago, and the answer to many prayers. The stakes of Zion will continue to increase until they fill these western continents of North and South America. These mountains will resound with shouts of joy of the lost 10 tribes who will come and help fill up these valleys. B.H. Roberts. As the Lord has said, that the work of the gathering together of my saints may continue, that I may build them up unto my name upon holy places, for the time of harvest is come, and my word must needs be fulfilled. Therefore I must gather together my people according to the parable of the wheat and the tares, that the wheat may be secured in the garners to possess eternal life and be crowned with celestial glory, when I shall come in the kingdom of my Father to reward every man according as his work shall be. Doctrine and Covenants, section 101. And now the temple stands majestically on the hill, a beautiful and magnificent structure. Its spire and stained glass windows are but earthly symbols describing the holy work that takes place within its walls, work that extends gospel blessings to the living and the dead through their faithfulness and acceptance, work which transforms lives, fulfills destinies, and realizes the promises of exaltation for all who remain faithful. Come, ye thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, ere the winter storms begin. God, our Maker, doth provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come. Raise the song of harvest home.
Our beloved Father in heaven, how grateful we are this evening for the privilege we've had of being here. We thank thee for this celebration, to celebrate not only this beautiful temple, thy house, which has been built here for us, but to celebrate our youth. We pray for them, Father. May they be strengthened. May they remain pure and strong. May they have the courage to stand for what's right, even if they have to stand alone. Bless them with courage and strength. We are thankful to thee for this beautiful temple. We are grateful for thy goodness and thy mercy and thy kindness to us, for thy blessings. We love thee, Father. We worship thee as our God. We are grateful for thy Son, Jesus Christ. We worship him and are thankful for his atonement. We love him and pray that thou would strengthen us to follow his teachings. We are grateful to thee for our new prophet, for the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and we pray for these dear men, for their sweet wives and their children, that they may be protected wherever they are, that thy spirit would rest with them and inspire them. We pray for peace this evening as we go home. We love thee, Father. We are thankful for this evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>